talk about here tonight is the fact that what goes on in your heart is critical to how you think, what you say, what you don't say, and the scriptures that we've been talking about. See, that's why they tell us in AA, NA, CA, CMA, GA, SA, um, all the different A's that we attend, the fact is that it's important that we do a fourth and a fifth step. It's important that we do a sixth and a seventh step because at the end of the day, what's stored up in us, as the Bible says, now, we look at things from a natural perspective of what the heart represents. We learned on Sunday that the heart has four valves. And if any of those four valves are clogged, it's going to be troublesome. Now, from a spiritual standpoint, there's also four valves. I'm here to tell you when my mom, we thought she had a heart attack. I told you about that story on Sunday. You know, the doctor says, who's the pastor? He, somehow he knew I was the pastor. God gave me the vision of this particular scripture. I didn't know it well. So it kind of was exciting to me to understand that I know for a fact that I heard from God. So God wants us to work this scripture a little more with the fact that this is important for him to really understand. So what do we know about the heart? Lord, I thank you for another day about coming out of prison. Are we going to be moving around up here? Are we good? Are we good? Okay. So the thing is... Lord, I thank you for another day above ground and out of prison. Lord, I thank you for everything you're doing in our midst. Lord, I ask for, for just the spirit of being able to hear tonight, Lord, about these important things. Lord, you are awesome. You are faithful. You picked up people like us and gave us another chance. Lord, I look forward to all the great things that are yet to come. Lord, I ask for forgiveness of my sharp attitude today, Lord, my irritability. Lord, I receive the purification. Lord, I thank you in advance for about what you're ready to do. Lord, I ask that you remove me from the equation and speak through me like never before. In your name we pray, amen. So, what the heart is saying here in Jeremiah 17, 9, is the fact that the heart is deceitful. We've learned in the last couple weeks of the fact that you know, a lot of times in our lives, we, we come to realize that the fact is that we follow our hearts. Now, what I learned in, in group a couple weeks ago is, if I'm honest with myself, when I have followed my heart, you've heard yourself say that, I'm, I'm going to follow my heart. But ask yourself tonight, in some of those cases, did you follow your heart to the right place? How many times did I, did, I, did I listen to the lie that I followed my heart? Because the Bible saying that the heart is deceitful above all things. What that tells me is this, that your heart will override everything. That's what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. But as I was studying for this today, it says your heart is deceitful above all things. It is desperately wicked. Now, I always used to blame my wicked behavior on when I was using but before I used, I thought about doing wicked behavior. Now, my addiction always took me farther than I want to go. And I've learned that now years later, is the fact of is that, that I'm, you know, your heart is desperately wicked. Now, now, let's break down those two words, desperate and wicked. In my addiction, when I was desperate, I did some wicked things. Did anybody else do some wicked things? So, look at the correlation between desperate and wicked. So, I know what, even in my recovery, if I'm honest with myself, and if I'm not taking advantage, as AA says, the daily reprieve, to, you know, contingent on your spiritual condition, depending on my spiritual condition, I might get desperate in my recovery and do some wicked things. And that was a wake-up call for me. Because I always thought that wickedness came from my addiction. See, and that's what that video is so important. The fact of is that, 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 you know, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So I want you to really understand from a spiritual standpoint, it's teaching us about our hearts. Now it says, who can know it? So that, that tells me this. I mean, why do I do the things I do? Why am I, you know, acting this way in my recovery? Why, why did I do that in my addiction? Why do I think the way I think? That's what the Bible is saying here now. Who can know it? I think we spend 
too much time trying to figure out why we are the way we are. You know, and that's why if you're really honest with yourself and you're anything like me, I did my own self-evaluation and I wrote my own prescriptions. I prescribed myself crack. Prescribed myself alcohol. Because I didn't understand why I was the way I was. And now it's talking about here in the Bible that it all comes down to the heart. You know, and, and it says, who can know it? Now it goes on to say, the Lord searches the heart. So that's what God is looking at. He's looking at your motives. Why are you here? What are you trying to accomplish? See, I was the type of guy, and it wasn't for the wrong reason, but I went to treatment and tried to get my family back. Trying to beat a case. Trying to do something, you know, trying to get back to what I lost. But those, those reasons I, I come to find aren't going to cut it. You know, and, and that's what it's saying. The Lord searches the heart. See, one thing I know about people, including myself, is my true colors will eventually show. The why behind what I'm doing will always be revealed. Sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. But I mean, and, and what it's saying here now is it says, the Lord searches out and it says, try to reign it. So I mean, I, I've tried to change. Only God can change me. See, I'm responsible for the effort. God's responsible for the outcome. But it says that God looks at the fruit of your doing. So if you're, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to tell you what you want to hear, but what the Bible's saying here is, God is looking at what you're doing. He's looking at what's in your heart. He's not really paying attention, nor are we, of what you're saying. What you say doesn't mean anything. What you do means something. And it's hard to hear the truth hurts. And one thing I've learned about the truth, the truth isn't going to adjust itself to me. I've got to adjust myself to the truth. But the key is what it's talking about the heart here is that it will always call us out. Proverbs 4.23, it says, keep your heart with all diligence. What that tells us is this. You can correlate it with the 10th step. You've got to be aware of the condition of your heart. We've talked about that over the last couple weeks. You can have a soft heart one minute. Your heart can harden from what somebody said, from something you saw, from something you heard, from something you didn't hear. Can, you know, we all know what it's like waiting for somebody to say something nice to us, and a day never comes. Could it be as a child, hey, I'm proud of you. When instead you heard, you'll never amount to nothing. The heart hardens. Waiting for somebody to forgive you, and they never do. See, that day may never come. But if you learn to experience forgiveness, it, 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 it's not going to really destroy you if you experience forgiveness for yourself when somebody doesn't forgive you. See, the ninth step of AA doesn't promise you that people are going to forgive you. What it promises you is your side of the street will get cleaned up. See, and, and we've got to understand what it's saying here. It says, you know, you know, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. So what that tells me is this, that everything that has ever happened to you is right here. Every good, bad, and indifferent thing that you have experienced in your life is held right here. That's why they tell us to do a fourth step. That's why they tell us to do a fifth step in regards to what's going on with your heart. Well, what did we just learn about the heart? It's deceitful above all things. It says, who can know it? So I don't understand why nobody would do what I've done. Why would I do that to myself? Why would I leave my family for drugs and alcohol? Why would I walk away that, that everything's important? Because the Bible says, now this gives me a little relief. The fact is it tells me why. That I don't need to get into analysis paralysis trying to figure it out. I just got to do the next right thing for the right reason. See, I mean, that's why they call it a one day at a time program. That's why they say it's a simple program for complicated people. We, if our heart condition is off, we complicate things. Now what it's saying in Ezekiel 36, 26, that God will give you a new heart and a new spirit. Well, that's what we've all experienced when we went to treatment. It's like you've got new zest, you've got a new heart, you've got a new spirit. Because what, what happens now, and I see this more times than not in recovery, is it says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you, so I will take out your stony and stubborn heart and give you a tender response. For it. That's why they tell us in AA that the newcomer is the most important person in the meeting, not so much that they have a lot to offer when it comes to wisdom, but the bottom line is you're going to see them being responsive to requests in direction because their heart is softened because you just got the crap kicked out. And God will do whatever means necessary to get your heart soft again. 
He will allow, like Mara said, you know, that's the best thing that ever happened to you. You could call me for three months, months trying to get back in here. See, God wants your heart soft. I mean, I, I mean, isn't it something that the farther you get away from your last drink or drug, that your heart because of the world and you allowing the world to harden it, you're not as responsive as you once were to the voice of God, to people asking you to help out, to go help out somebody that's in need. All of a sudden, you're too busy. And the only thing you're busy with is the thing that God allowed you to have back, because if it had anything to do with me, I'd wreck it again. So I can't be too busy with what God has allowed me back. So i got to ask God continuously to remove my stony, stubborn heart and give me a tender, response heart. Then we learned in Proverbs 4.23, above all else, the Bible says, guard your heart. So once God gives, see how many times you go to treatment, your heart was soft, you were responsive and tender, you were willing and open-minded, you got a sponsor, you went to meetings, but slowly but surely your heart hardened, you weren't as responsive as you once were because you weren't guarding your heart. The Bible says, above all else, guard your heart, but your past hardens your heart, your present hardens your heart, your fears about your future harden your heart, and, and before you know it, you're not responsive to anything. You've lost your sensitivity. Nobody can tell you nothing. You've got all the answers. Entitlement creeps in. You're going to call your own shots. And the Bible says that pride goes before destruction. Let me be very clear with you. My best thinking got me locked up. My best thinking got me homeless. I'm telling you, I'm creative. I can come up with a game plan quick. But, well, the game was over. The best thing that's ever happened to me when it, God said, game over. Either you're going to come with me or you're going down. The best thing that ever happened to me. So what, what the Bible's saying is that above all else, you have to guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. Another translation says, your heart and the condition of it determines the course of your life. See, what goes on here determines on what goes on out here. And you've got to understand that it's extremely important to grasp the fact that this is important. The condition of this is important. This could affect you might use tonight, or whatever it may be. So tonight, I want to talk to you about the vision that I had, where it says the facts on what God looks at and what He wants. So what did we learn? Now, it says in Psalm 17.3, what are you planning? See, I mean, I had much respect. Where's Jacob? See, I, in my group last week, I mean, I, people get twisted towards me all the time. People, you know, get twisted towards Trinity Village. So in our group of 40 men last week, I said, is anybody twisted? If they are, I mean, I, I am honestly going to put a twisted section over here next week. And it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you because, you, you know, 50% of you are twisted right now. You are on something that happened today, something I said in the last 20 minutes. But Jacob texted me at 10 o'clock on, um, on Tuesday night and said, I'm twisted against you and against Serenity Village. I respected that. Amen. You know how many people say stay twisted and do foolish things and never say anything about it? How old are you? A 20-year-old saying that to me. I respect that. I, you know, and we talked about it, and later on that night, you know how much courage it took for him to say that? I mean, as we were talking, I didn't take it personal. I didn't, you know, but I mean, I'm here to tell you, if you don't talk about that kind of stuff, so what it's saying here now is like, what are you planning? It says, though you probe my heart. See, I mean, I, I, we put this house together, people were running 18, 19 hour days with me. I was watching them. I was watching how much stamina they, they could keep up with. But it says, though you probe my heart. I, I, sometimes God and, and your sponsor, they might like to push you a little bit to see what you're made of. Because talk is cheap. But, but when it comes down to it, are you really who you say you are? Are you really who you appear to be? And what it's saying, I mean, we've all been in the doctor's office when they probe stuff. But I, 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 I sometimes, it's interesting to me when, when I begin to push some people a bit. Okay, you say you're real? Let me push you a little bit. Boy, you find out who they really are. And that's what the Bible's saying here is, though you probe my heart, examine me day and night, you find that I have planned no evil. So now, I, had, I looked at the word planning. So how many, I, I've learned over time that what you behold, you become. So if I'm thinking about it, the majority of the time I'm going to end up doing it. 
For example, your last relapse or something that you planned, you know, you were thinking about. So God here now is looking at what are you planning on doing? And and it says in your mouth. So I mean, I, I mean, they told me call my sponsor on the way to the bar. Okay, if I'm on the way to the bar, it's too late. <laughs> Because I've been locked and loaded for many hours, if not days, what I'm going to do. I've been planning it. And I'm not saying God can't intervene because there's no temptation that sees you. That's just my experience. It's my experience, so don't judge. But I mean, that is my... Because I mean, I've been, I've been mesmerized with drinking and I don't tell anybody about it. See, Jacob told somebody about it. I respect that. And are you twisted now? See, but how many people just they like staying twisted? See, and, 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 and it's like, it, it's, I mean, Scotty and I were joking about it. He says, I'm, you know, I, it's, he gets twisted, I get twisted. See, but you mean getting twisted and staying twisted are two different things. See, I don't want to stay twisted. But it says, probing my heart now, it says in Deuteronomy. Now, this is the scripture when I was in the emergency room with my mom. God said, go to this, and I didn't even know it. So, what does God want from you? It tells us right here. And I think it's an age old thing. It's a step three, make a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God. I really want you to focus on the word care. So, I mean, do you believe that God can care for you better than you can care for yourselves? You've got to remember that your best thinking got you here. My best thinking got me here. So, I've got to turn my life. And, and now, am I as close to God as I would like, depending on the condition, the daily reprieve, as the big book says, contingent. Contingent means it's conditional. See, I, I've been talking with Jackson. I mean, he's totally twisted. <laughs> totally twisted where he packed his bags. Pardon me for throwing you out on front street. But I'll throw me and my family out on front street to help you out any day of the week. Move his stuff out on Sunday night during church. Turn off his phone. Don't tell me you don't get twisted. <laughs> in drastic, drastic craziness. Sat with him on Sunday night at 2 in the morning because he's important to me. And I said, you know what the, the Spirit's just put into my heart right now is that, you know, you, you got to watch what affects you. you you've got to watch because on a daily basis there's a lot of things that will affect you. And if you allow your heart to get hardened, if you allow yourself to get twisted and not text somebody about it or ask somebody about it, what happens is the ability of being affected, you get infected. And you know from a medical standpoint, if you're affected by something and it turns into an infection, it's a different ballgame. It's a different set of treatment. It's a different, it's, you know, coming out of it thing. So, I mean, as I talked to him, we talked about, so last night I sat with him and Nikki, and, uh, you know, I said, now, what, 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 how did you get here? Because you didn't get in this position that you were in on Sunday where everything blew up. It just didn't happen Sunday when you woke up. There's been stuff going down before. This stuff has been stuff. Stuff has been talked about. And different things. So we began to talk about the controllable versus uncontrollable things that happen in life. Now, there's things that can happen. Like Scott and Penny, they, 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 they're building a new house. They, they're getting married in, less, in about a month, actually. They're, you know, so those are, those are, you know, there's a lot of stuff that they can't control what happens in the next 30 days. Is this going to go as well as planned? Is that going to go as well as planned? But what they can control is, are, on the, are they on their knees in the morning? Did they read their devotional this morning? Did they go to church? Did they, those are controllable things. So if you're, if you're doing well with your controllable, when the uncontrollable circumstances that can affect the condition of your heart happen, then it doesn't hit you like this. And that's when I talked to Mickey and Jackson until 2 in the morning last night. I'm not getting much sleep lately. And what's happening is that, that you've got to control what you can. Now, the word control you can't misconstrue for what it really is. You do have power to, to get closer to God. You can get on your knees. You can read a 24-hour-a-day book. You can tell somebody. You're, those are controllable things. When life happens on life's terms, and any drug addict and alcoholic, I hate life on life's terms. But when it happens in your recovery, if you're doing what you can do in the controllable, you, the uncontrollable things won't affect you. And, and it's so important that you understand that what is God looking for? He wants you to respect, He wants you to follow, He wants you to love, and He wants you to serve Him. So now, I, I want to just quickly evaluate those four topics. And we talked about the valve. Now, Dan McKinney sent me a text at about 1 in the morning on Sunday. Bless my heart. Bless my heart. He says, you know, if two of the valves are blocked, the other two don't, even though they're open, they don't function the way they should. 
So you've got to understand, if you're not being respectful, you're not going to be able to follow. And if you're not following and respecting, are you really serving? Are you just serving yourself? Or are you serving for the wrong reasons? See, we, we've got to understand how all these things are intertwined when it says this. So now, so the, que the first question, and for some of you that were not here on Sunday, it won't make 100% clarity, but you'll get there within five minutes. We're talking about a valve of the heart. The heart has four valves. Now we just recently, just now, read a scripture that says that what does God want from me? He wants four things from you, the Bible says. There's four valves in the human heart. Now we're looking at the heart from a spiritual condition where it says it's, it, it's, it's, it's deceptive above all things. Out of it springs the issues of life. Once God gives you a new one, you better guard it because by not guarding it or guarding it, it will determine, the Bible says, the course of your life. No different. I mean, if you get sober and don't work a fourth and a fifth step, that fourth and fifth will always be carrying around baggage your whole life. God wants you to unload that stuff. But what it's saying here now about respect, let me tell you, you hear me say this often, the greatest form of respect is self-respect. The reason why people don't respect people is because they don't respect themselves. They don't respect God. They don't even know who He is. So, the, the, you know, what it's saying here now is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. I'm asking you and, and, and telling me that my best thinking got me here. The fear of the Lord, the Bible says, is the beginning of knowledge. And fools despise wisdom and construction. To, you know, instruction. The bottom line is, if, my, if I come to the agreement that my best thinking got me here, but I ain't going to listen to what you have to say or my pastor or my sponsor, I'm a fool. I'm a fool. Are there any fools in the house? I mean, you better know who you are. See, you better get to know yourself, your flesh, so you can see yourself coming. There's a side of you that ain't pretty, and there's a side of me that's probably even less pretty. And that's what we've been teaching on as of late. See, I mean, and, and this, is, this is deep stuff. I, I, I looked at this, and I broke it down. It says, the fear of the Lord. Now, isn't it something that people like myself... What does it say about, I mean, fear in the four step? It, you bracket it, it affects my self-esteem, so self whatever, whatever the, the brackets are, I just did some fifth steps with some guys. You know, but, but fear is one of them, resentment's another one, sexual conduct, and, and, and the different things. But, but what it's saying is the fear of the Lord is really respecting what God has done for you. But how is it, as I was studying for this today, I, I, I began to meditate on the word fear. Now, how is it that a fear... If you're just contaminated person like I used to be, be so afraid of everything in my I see it in the jails all the time. I was telling um, this gentleman, Greg, on the way over here, you know, I see these guys put up this facade like they ain't afraid of nothing. Those are the most afraid boys I've ever met in a men's prison. Boys in a men's prison. And what I see is, well, how is it that I can be so fear struck, but I'm not afraid to use it? I should be afraid if I use it in my life. In my recovery, I'm afraid of everything. But I'm not afraid of what would happen to me if I pick up it. That doesn't even make sense. It, it, but, but what it's saying is, where is the condition of your heart? And now it says in Romans 13, it says, let everyone be subject to governing authorities. There is no authority except what God has established. But it goes on to say, the authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against authorities is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. So what I mean, I don't, I don't like being around people that complain about the boss. Their heart's hard. A lot of people that complain about the boss have never been a boss. A lot of people that complain about the owner have never been an owner. See, and, 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 and even as the, 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 the person that God has selected to, you know, start Serenity Village, being me, the, the biggest knucklehead ever, I mean, I don't, this wasn't something I wanted to do. It's not something that was a dream or a goal of mine. It still really isn't. I got better stuff to do with my time. But God's plan is better than mine. My plan got me here. See, I, I got to throw my plans out the way. See, and, and, and what it's saying is here, if you rebel against authority that God has put in your life, you know what, what I do a lot of times when people get twisted? 
I just step back and pray for them because they tell me that in pages 60 through 63. I step back and pray for them and I really pray for them because God's going to deal with them. Yeah. See, I, I was that guy too that, that came into a program like this or a treatment center and uh, my heart was soft and told you I was going to do whatever it took. But I would ask you that as my wife comes up here, what is it that causes us to get this valve clogged? Why is it that we can't? Now it says in Matthew 7, 12, are we respecting yourself and others? I mean, so in everything, to me that rings true with practices, principles, and all your affairs. Right? Don't act this way at work, this way at home, this way at your AA meeting on Monday night. Practice these principles in all your affairs. You're not going to be able to do that really until you get to step 12. Because you got too much stuff going on. You got too much fear, resentment, you got character defects, you got shortcomings, you've got unforgiveness through the amends. You haven't even learned how to take a personal inventory. How can you possibly take a personal inventory with a 10 step when you got all this baggage going on? You don't know if you're coming or going until you work the steps. You're coming to the conclusions on when you're wrong and you should probably admit it? Please. You gotta understand, so I would ask you, what would make a person disrespect a person? Let's hear from you. Pride. Pride. Insecurity. False pride. One more time. False pride. False pride. Jealousy. That's a big one. Selfishness. I don't think everybody under the sound of my voice is good at respecting people. We should have more answers than this. Fear. Fire. Hurt. Fitness. Danger. Anything else? Trails. Theological thinking. Resentment. Resentment. Scotty said ego. You know, one thing I learned out, the reason why I don't trust a lot early on in recovery, I didn't trust myself. I mean, I used to, you know, be the type of guy that didn't trust my girlfriend, but I was going behind her back. Who's been those people? Oh, please, get them up there. <laughs> but, but, I mean, but, but, but Kara brought up a point here is the fact of distrust, right? So even if you don't trust somebody, it doesn't give you free reign to disrespect them. What's that about? Because <laughs> a lot of times, what else in, in, when it comes to respect? Betrayal. <clears throat> One more time, betrayal? Betrayal. That's good. Envy. When they tell you what time it is, is that right? <laughs> So, but one of the things that God wants from you is to respect Him, the people that God has put in your life to help you, your, even people you work for. I mean, I mean, life is too short to not respect your boss. Just go work somewhere else. I mean, a lot of, I mean, you hear me say this often. I mean, we've got over 100 employees in our company, and we've got a lot of superstars. The superstars get up every day and kick butt. The ones that couldn't get a job for the life of them at any other company complain about everything. It just doesn't make sense. You know, I get calls all, all the time. I mean, 20, 30 calls a day from people who have got 100 questions that are, you know, we're used to, I mean, you used to be like me. I mean, you're, you're living nowhere, but you've got a criteria of where you want to live. You got a single bed. Is there cable internet? Dude, where are you at right now? I'm at the bus station. <laughs> well, they got a single room down there at internet? I don't know. <laughs> times helping people with domestic violence. I swear I'll never hit for anybody because I've watched my dad hit my mama and the next 10 years from now you're hitting your wife. 
The devil is a liar. It's not because you're a bad person or you want him to do that. This stuff is crazy. And it comes down to the condition of your heart. So the second thing that God is looking at the heart foul condition is who are you following? Now it says in Luke 9.23, it says, are you being selfish or selfless? You know, and, and, and humility is not, you know, and I love what Purpose Driven Life says about being selfish, but in Luke 9.23, it says, you know, then he said, no, whoever wants to me, be my disciple. What that means is this, there's nothing you have done that can disqualify you from this. So don't listen to that voice anymore. I don't care how many times, and God doesn't care, and we don't care how many times you screwed up. The fact if you're under the sound of my voice, you still have another opportunity. See, God, God does stuff where it says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. You've got to come to the realization that it's no longer about you. It's not about you anymore. And that's what the Bible is saying. It says, you know, take up your cross daily and follow me. I would ask you, you, you cannot follow yourself. Quit following yourself. You've got to follow God and follow whoever God put in your life. That's why they tell us in AA attraction rather than promotion. Now it says in Hebrews 13, 17, are you a joy to deal with? I mean, I was one of those guys, if you were to ask anybody, oh, we got to go deal with Jeff. Or I mean, I got employees. Oh, I got to go deal with him again? Are you kidding me? Why is he still working here? I mean, I don't want to be one of those people. But what it says now, obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls and they are accountable to God. You know, that really stinks for me. That I'm accountable on how I act towards you and what I do or don't do if you're in this program. And I'm a people pleaser. I don't want to. See, my whole life was built on what you thought of me. So when I got to come down on something, that stinks for me. I hate it. There's some people on this planet that love that. It ain't me. It ain't anybody that's a leader for me either. And, and, and the key is that what it says is obey your spiritual leaders. Do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls and your accountable God. Give them a reason to do this with joy, not with sorrow. They would certainly not be for your benefit. I mean, how many times have you told your boss off and then got fired? Who lost? Your boss is still a boss. <laughs> you ain't got a job. You know, and, and, and we get, but, but I, I'm going to ask you as my wife goes up there real quickly is that, I mean, what would make you not follow God and your sponsor or this program? What makes you not do that? Rebellion. Are you all in in your program? 
It all depends on the condition of your heart. Hebrews 12, 5, and 6. How are you handling correction? You know, a lot, I, I'll tell you what, in my early recovery, I never disciplined my kids because I was a guilty parent. And I bought them whatever they wanted. Let me tell you, it did the most disservice you will ever see. You didn't know what you don't want to do your homework, oh, no problem. See, and, 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 and because I felt so much shame and guilt, but what it's saying here in Hebrews 12 is, how are you handling correction? It says, for God in this word of encouragement addresses you as a father and a son. It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not look, lose heart when he rebukes you. That, that's what often gets me. Well, I'll tell you, if the crack dealer told me what time it was, I just go to a different crack dealer. But if you were the pastor or my sponsor gets on my case, I crumble and start crying and get resentful and get mad and get entitled and get full of pride. I am, who are you talking to me? Who are you to think you were talking to me like, well, I'm the guy who picked your butt up from the bus station. That's who I am. I mean, this isn't coddling time. This isn't, this isn't romper room. This is freedom time. This is freedom time. But what it's saying is, my son do not take light. It says, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves. And check. So, I mean, I love it when, I mean, people take my kindness for weakness. They stick in it. Oh, they're, they're Christians, so they, they have to be. They got, they're going to let this go because they're Christians. Why are you talking about you can try to manipulate me? Dude, I mean I can bounce out of not being a Christian just as quick as you can. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean I am a Christian, but we also got principles here. And, and, and it's like, you know, don't, don't, I mean, that's one thing I, I've seen in, in, in myself and in other people is you know, as soon as a manipulative person finds somebody that will help them, they just take them to the cleaners. Before you drop them off, you got 10 bucks, you got 20 bucks, well, oh, you gave me 10 last week, give me 30 this week. Take an inch, give an inch, they'll take them on. And if your heart's hardened and you've got a sense of entitlement, you feel this world owes you something, it ain't, it ain't how it works. See, I mean, it, 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 it says now in 1 Corinthians 6, is, how are you treating your body? Do, don't you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've been received from God? You are not your own. You've been bought with right. Boy, I wrecked my body. And still don't eat right. Still don't drink enough water. But I mean, I mean, do I love myself? Do I treat myself with respect? And if I do that, I treat you with respect. In John 15, 13, is anyone benefiting from your life? That's a big question you have to answer from your, for yourself. Who is benefiting because you're on the planet? And I would ask you, what stops us from loving? But it says in the Bible, there is no greater love than this to lay down one's life for your friends. I mean, I mean, the people in, in, in AA that are solid AA people, NA people, people that, that are part of Serenity Village or the church, they lay down their life so somebody like me can get this. So what would make you not want to love? Let's hear some things. Betrayal. What was that, buddy? Resentment. I'm being forgiven. Don't know what it is. Don't know what it is. Self-centered. I said to these two last night at 2 in the morning. It's the truth. We've looked for love in all the wrong places our whole lives. Abandonment. Abandonment. Infidelity. Anything else? You don't have God in their life. No God, because God is love. You don't feel worthy. And I'll tell you what, the reason why I use drugs and alcohol is because I didn't. 
I didn't know how to receive it from God. I didn't know who God was. I didn't know how to give love. I thought love was conditional. I grew up in conditions at a young age. You'll be proud of me if I score a goal. You'll be proud of me if I do this. And then once I started doing the things that didn't make them proud of me, that now defined my life. See, and, and, and what it's saying now is a last heart valve of service. Let me tell you, you got it. it I really got it before you guys go to group. If you're not operating on all four valves, you can't really serve if you don't love. I mean, that's why everybody quits serving, because their heart's not in it. They do it because they have to. As soon as they don't have to do it, they don't do it. Right. Serenity Village is not a place that you have no other options than just to come here. You know, so, I mean, if you're operating tonight, you know, it's a good time to look at this stuff, but I'm going to ask you real quick. It says, I plead with you to give your bodies to God for all he's done for you. If you don't, if you're not, if you're not working a program and you're not out of service and you don't respect, you don't follow, you don't love, you don't serve, you fail to recognize what God has done for you. I don't even care if you don't believe in God. You should not be under the sound of my voice if you use drugs and alcohol like I do. How many people have driven drunk in this room? What if you would have killed somebody? What if you did? See, I mean, but what it's saying is here, I plead with, to give you. Why would anybody have to plead with a person like me who's been to 11 treatments to work a program? Why do your house leaders have to plead with you to hit the second meeting? Why do they have to plead with you to get a sponsor? I mean, I mean, and, and I'm, I'm in the circle with you. I've been this person. So, I mean, this isn't about saying you're a bad person or trying to say It's about get to know yourself so you can see yourself coming. And it says, I plead with you to give your bodies. So go all in with your program. It says the kind he will find acceptable. See, I mean, I mean, at the end of the day, um, like I said earlier, I mean, is, is, is my program acceptable to God? Is it acceptable to me? You know, and, and, you know, and I said this on a team challenge on, 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 on Friday. Is, I mean, does my dope lifestyle get as much as my recovery lifestyle did when it comes to my time? And, and what it's saying here in John 12, 26 is, are you attending SV missions and others? God put Serenity Village on the planet with the addition of the church, not because we deserved it or were good, because He is good. What do they teach us in AA? Be of service. Why are you not serving? It says right here, for God is not unjust. He's not going to lose His reputation over you. And I'm not, I'm not speaking to anybody in particular. Don't say he's speaking to me. Well, don't leave that's between you and God. But for God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you worked for him. Now what was the earlier question? What does God want from you? It's answered again right here. How you've shown your love to him. You show your love to God by caring for other people. That's it right there. But if you will not be able to care for other people, if you don't even care about yourself. See, they told me a long time ago, you must have low self-worth. I don't think so. So why do you put yourself back in prison? Why do you put yourself in jail? Why do you put yourself in another treatment center? You must not think very highly of yourself. That got my attention. That got my attention. But what it's saying here now is, you know, it says, you have shown your love to him by caring for other believers as you still do. Not what you did last week. Not what you did last year. As you still do, it says. That means it never stops. If you want to be operating in service of honor, end with this. Why don't we serve? What would be a reason why? AA says, I mean, you've got to be of service. What should I do? Pick up that chair and bring it to the corner. It's as simple as that. Oh, I'm better than that. Really? Were you just crawling around the floor looking for crack? You weren't better for that. Or, you know, hiding that bottle in your closet with your kid walked by. And... I did all that. They found a crack pipe in my kid's toys. It's not, I'm not proud of it. But don't, you didn't get here on a winning streak, nor did I. 
you've done some wicked things. But I serve a faithful God, so what would make us not serve? You're not going to be right every day. You're 
not going to be mentally strong every day. You're not going to be spiritually solid every day. That's unrealistic. I'm not. There's days when I want to jump on a plane and never to be seen again. It happens to me. It happens to you. You are in the right place. Take off your shoes and enjoy the ride. I love you. God bless you.